So I decided to split this topic into two videos, because by the time I got to the in-camera settings section of this video, I realized that I already skipped a ton of useful information about HDMI cables that I wish was included. So rather than make a 30 minute video about HDMI, we're gonna split it into two parts, and today's video is gonna be all about HDMI connectors and cables. Let's get undone. What is happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and today we're talking about HDMI. Now, there is a ton of stuff we could cover when it comes to HDMI, a lot of which pertains to the consumption of content with home theater and general entertainment realms. But instead, we're gonna focus on the content creation side of HDMI, which basically means plugging your camera into things. And this can be anything from an external monitor recorder or a capture card or using it to stream. Like I said in the intro, I'm gonna be making a follow-up and companion video to this one in the next couple days that details some of the in-camera settings and common issues found there. So make sure you keep your eye out for that. And once that video is up, I'll probably put links to it in the description and the comments below on this video in case you're viewing this one after the fact. But for today, the topics I wanna to cover are the different HDMI versions, the HDMI cable types, avoiding marketing nonsense, the importance of data rates, the HDMI connectors, and I'll also give you a couple products that I personally recommend, as well as giving you a bit of a buyer's guide towards HDMI cables and accessories. So let's start off with some basic information on HDMI and the versions of it. So HDMI stands for High Definition Multimedia Interface, and is basically designed to transmit uncompressed video and potentially audio to compliant devices. For creators, this basically means that you can transmit digitally and unadulterated to external hardware to perform compression and conversion on a more capable device. But as the specs of those devices have changed and improved over the years, so have the versions of HDMI that are available. Every few years we see a full number version emerge like HDMI 1.4 in 2009 and HDMI 2.0 in 2013. And then there's smaller letter revisions that take place in between those like 2.0A in 2015 and 2.0B in 2016 up to the latest version which is version 2.1 which came out late 2017. Now each of the major version numbers that come out generally bring with it new things but the key component is the increasing bandwidth that comes out version after version which allows more more data to be transmitted quicker. The smaller letter revisions like A and B generally keep the parent version's bandwidth, but they just add more minor features and support for things like HDR. And as the bandwidth and feature support improves, so do the signals that we can transmit from our camera. If you want to see a chart showing the compatibility, there's this great one on the Wikipedia page which I have up here for HDMI. It's about halfway down the page and it looks like this. So for example, when HDMI 1.2 came out, it didn't support 4K. At the best it could transmit was 1080p with a maximum of 60 frames per second. But when the bandwidth was increased from 4 gigabits per second to 8 gigabits per second, which is what you'd find on HDMI 1.3 and HDMI 1.4, you can now transmit 1080p up to 144 frames per second and 4K up to 30 frames per second. But if you want 4K 60, you'll need to get HDMI 2.0. Now HDMI 1.4 does support 4K 60 as it says here, but only with 420 chroma subsampling. So if you want true RGB or even 422, you'll have to get HDMI 2.0. That being said though, HDMI 2.0 has been around since about 2013, so if you bought your camera after that, it's likely to have it. But it's even more unlikely that you would have a camera capable of shooting 4K 60 that doesn't have HDMI 2.0, because 4K 60 is a lot newer and less common than HDMI 2.0 is. So let's say your camera has HDMI 2.0 and the device you're transmitting to has it as well. What about the cable? You need a matching cable too, right? And this is where a lot of the nonsense starts to emerge. And I, I imagine that most of this was motivated by sales strategies, obviously, trying to sell cables when new HDMI versions come out. But because of that, it can be kind of difficult to sift through all the marketing BS, so allow me to cut through most of it for you. There are no versions of HDMI cables, and by that I mean version 1.4, version 2.0, etc. And there also aren't frame rates and resolution type cables, so there's no 4K 60p cable, which you see that advertised often. That's all just marketing nonsense. These HDMI cables are basically just pipes. They don't carry with them the complicated specifications of the devices they're connected to. So here's what you actually need to know about HDMI cables. They only have very generalized speed ratings. Just like if we go back to our pipe metaphor, they basically just detail how much data can flow through the pipe at once. So there's standard speed and there's high speed, and you can actually see this written down the cable. This one here, it says high speed HDMI cable with ethernet. Both speeds, standard and high, might have with ethernet written at the end of it. And all this means is that there's a slightly different wiring to support ethernet. But all that's important for your camera 
is the speed part. Generally speaking, the standard speed cables are dinosaurs and should be avoided because they were originally rated only for 720p. And to be honest, I haven't really seen them for sale much anymore these days, so you should be fine. But high speed is what you want. Now it does get a little bit tricky here because not all high speed cables will perform the same and there are a few factors that lead to this. Age being one of them. Because as we said, the specs have improved dramatically over the years, so an older high speed cable may not have been tested to reach today's standards. Quality also plays a role because low quality cables may not be capable of carrying the highest settings of a camera due to poor transmittance. If we go back to our pipe metaphor, it'd be like buying a leaking or corroded pipe. It just ain't flowing that well through it because of low quality. And then lastly, and probably the most common, the length. The longer the cable, the more loss you'll experience. Now this loss doesn't really present as just a working cable or a dead cable that you should throw out, but instead it kind of lowers the tiers of camera settings that will be available. So for example, I have two cables here. I have a six foot cable and and I have a 25 foot cable. And they're both made by the same manufacturer at the same time, and they're both of high quality. Now, if I connect both of these to the Sony a7 III, which is capable of 4K 30p at its highest setting, both of the cables will work, and they work fine, and I haven't had any issues. But if I connect them to the GH5, which is capable of 4K at 60p and at 10 bit, the six foot cable will keep working, but the 25 foot cable won't. But then if we dial the GH5 down to only 30 frames per second, down from 60 frames per second, the 25 foot cable starts working again. Because again, it all comes back to data rates and the longer cable just isn't capable of transmitting sufficient data quickly enough to keep up with the 4K60. You're gonna get different results with different cable makers, but for the most part, anything over 15 feet is when you'll start to experience problems. Now, if you wanna maintain long cable lengths and high resolution and high frame rates, you're gonna need to get a cable with the repeater on it or get a repeater separately, which basically just boosts your signal, but expect to pay a lot more for that. Now to help combat the doubts that one might have when purchasing a cable, there was a new speed designation that came out in 2015 to go along with HDMI 2.0, and this is called premium high speed HDMI cable. And this basically just guarantees that the cable has the bandwidth required to support all the resolutions and features covered under HDMI 2.0. But there's two caveats to that. One, that still doesn't make the cable an HDMI 2.0 cable, it's a premium high-speed HDMI cable. So despite whatever nonsense the manufacturers might put on the box, the cable itself should read premium high-speed HDMI cable. And secondly, it also doesn't mean that you need a premium high-speed cable to support HDMI 2.0. Personally, I've still never bought one and I don't see a lot of them around when I shop. If you don't need long lengths, you can very likely get everything you need from a modern, decent quality, regular high-speed HDMI cable, and I'll give you a couple suggestions of which one to get in a second. The last thing I wanna say about HDMI versions, speeds, and cables, that there's also another newer designation to go along with HDMI 2.1, and this one's called Ultra High-Speed HDMI Cable. And just like the premium high-speed cable for HDMI 2.0, this is a certification to guarantee that the cable is capable of the bandwidth required, but in this case for HDMI 2.1, the Ultra high-speed HDMI cable. HDMI 2.1, by the way, really took it up a notch from the 18 gigabits per second on the HDMI 2.0 up to 48 gigabits per second on HDMI 2.1, which is where the cable gets its other name, which is the 48G cable, as in 48 gigabits per second, and it's also called a Category 3 HDMI cable. Personally, I wish all of HDMI would use this naming convention. Rather than using version numbers and broad terms like high speed, we would just talk about its bandwidth. So instead of HDMI 1.4, we would call it HDMI 10 10G for the 10.2 gigabits per second. And with HDMI 2.0, it would be 18G and 48G for HDMI 2.1. That would be a lot easier. You knew if you were using an HDMI 18G connection, you would need an 18G cable and it would be written right on the cable because that would guarantee the bandwidth and would be tested and certified and would say it right on the cable. I think that would be the best way to do it and be a lot less confusing. But enough of my idealistic rants. I told you that I would tell you what cable I think you should buy. And the answer is Amazon Basics. If you look at their standard six foot HDMI cable, which is only $7 US or $7.50 Canadian, it says right in the description, supports bandwidth up to 18 gigabits per second, which is exactly what I was just talking about a minute ago, which means we're good for all that HDMI 2.0 has to offer. Now it might not support all the features of HDMI 2.1, but those are quite a bit beyond what consumer level cameras are capable of anyway. If we go back to the chart of the HDMI breakdown from earlier, we can see that HDMI 2.1 is capable of 4K at 120 frames per second at 444 subsampling, or 8K at 30 frames per second. I don't imagine your camera can do that, and if it can, you're probably not looking for HDMI solutions at the moment. But back to the Amazon Basics cables, don't let the price scare you off. 
I said you needed a quality cable. I didn't say expensive. Because expensive cables have been one of the biggest rip-offs ever perpetrated by big box electronics stores. I've been using them almost exclusively now for quite a while and they're really great. And this actually kind of sounds like an ad for Amazon Basics cables. <laughs> Trust me, this is not an ad. Amazon does not need me to sell their cables for them. And again, we're talking about a $7 product here. But they're just, they're just really, really great cables. They're strong, reliable, they last a long time, gold-plated contacts. Actually, while we're on the topic of the gold-plated thing, there's some mixed opinions on this. Basically, the gold plating is generally used for corrosion resistance. And this probably isn't that important if you're in a climate-controlled indoor space. But... My personal opinion is that the gold-plated connectors that I've used tend to fit a bit more securely than the nickel-plated ones. And because we're talking about a $7 cable and because the Amazon Basics, I don't believe, has a cheaper nickel-plated option, for seven bucks, you might as well go gold. I feel like it makes a better connection. Now I can only vouch for these cables in the conditions that I've tested them under, but I can say that they're good for up to 4K, 60 frames per second at 10 bit 422. And what's interesting about them is they're not premium high speed, even though I've had no issues hitting the HDMI 2.0 standard. If you look on the side of these ones, they're just regular, just high speed HDMI cable, which goes to support what I said earlier, which is that a not too long, not too old, decent quality, regular, high-speed HDMI cable is all you need. If, however, you have something against Amazon Basics and you want a different brand recommendation, I've had a lot of success as well with a brand called Ugreen, which comes in around the same price, maybe just a little bit more. I'll put some links in the description to some different cable combinations that might be helpful to you. And you can also get these cables and other connector types like micro and mini, which I suppose is a perfect time to talk about the HDMI connectors. There are three common connectors you'll encounter when it comes to HDMI. You've got your standard one, which is also known as a Type A. Then you've got your micro or Type D, and then you get a slightly less common one called Mini or Type C. The micro is the smallest and the mini just kind of looks like a shrunken down type A. If it was up to me when it comes to cameras, they'd all be type A. I vastly prefer a more robust connector and the type A just gives me a lot more confidence than the others. Now you don't have a lot of choice in this because you basically just have to go with whatever your camera requires, but if there's any camera manufacturers listening, stop putting micro HDMI ports into reasonably large cameras. Take the Sony a7 III for example, you could have easily fit a type A connector in there like the one that's on the GH5 and it would have made it significantly better when it comes to plugging and cables. But to you shooters who are working with one of the smaller connectors, I do have some advice for you. Go with a straight, compact, and preferably unadapted cable. I've used all kinds and these are the ones that I keep coming back to. Also there's two things that I would seriously avoid. The first is one of these. Now when I first got this, I thought it was the perfect solution. I even recommended it on a previous video because of the right angle design. You put in the camera like this and then the cable comes down, you get this right angle. But I've since changed my mind on that for a few reasons. Firstly, it's completely unpredictable these days which direction the camera manufacturer is gonna face the port inside the camera. So you may get this thing and the right angle is gonna go down, but then when you actually connect it, the cable faces up. And then even if the port is the right way, like in the case of the Sony, it plugs in like this and then the cable that comes below is blocking your other ports like the USB ports and stuff like that. Plus any benefit that you would get to the right angle design is completely undermined by the fact that the extra bulk and size of this adapter, plus when you put a full size HDMI connector into it to adapt, you've now got this whole extra bulky chunky thing on it that's putting stress on the port versus say just this micro HDMI cable, which was the end result. The other thing that I would avoid when it comes to adapting cables is big and bulky cables that are you know thicker or have a lot of weight. I've had this on my GH5 with a monitor and it actually unscrewed the monitor from the ball head just from its desire to kind of like uncurl itself. This I suppose is why coiled connections are popular when it comes to attaching external monitors because they solve a lot of those aforementioned problems. They're direct connections so there's no adapting, they don't add any extra weight, they don't, it doesn't really matter which way the port is facing and they don't block any other ports. But they're generally quite a bit more expensive and you don't really get a large extensive database of reviews to know which one to get because they're not very popular because they're pretty much useless outside of rigging up a monitor. And I'm not too keen on paying three to four times more for a less useful item unless it really solved the problem like no other, but it doesn't. And again, I wanna direct you back to the Amazon Basics cables I was recommending. They're lean and compact and don't seem to mind being coiled up. They don't really give that spring back thing I was talking about where they're gonna like push your monitor out of the way, which means you can usually use like a Velcro cable tie to just kind of secure the cable however you want, but then undo it and use the cable full run if you want to as well. 
more options, less money. However, if you'd still prefer to adapt, I recommend that you go with an extension adapter like this one from Ugreen, which allows you to remove the bulk away from the camera by a few inches, so that if you were doing any kind of heavy stuff down here, it's not gonna be blocking the ports up here, and you can also tie it down or up and secure it and stop the weight from negatively impacting the port. And that's pretty much it for HDMI versions and cables. In the next video, we're gonna be talking about a whole set of new issues that arise when you actually connect your camera to things due to some inexplicable design and software choices from the camera makers. But until then, I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining, and if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right, I'm done.